All right, what's up, everybody? Thanks for coming out. Welcome all y'all right there online and at our campuses. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm Jared, have the joy of getting to be the senior pastor of these wonderful people known as Grace. So great to have you all. We're in a series called Foundations. So what we've been doing is looking at the Sermon on the Mount and just following it scripture by scripture, text by text, verse by verse. And what I love about doing that is that it forces us to confront whatever is in the text. I'm not picking, I'm not choosing. We're simply just following the words of Jesus. And what I love to say is we're not choosing the scriptures. The scriptures are choosing us for what we are to confront in our lives. And so we're going to do that today to be sure we're laying the right foundation in our walk with Christ, uh, in our beliefs, our trust, and also for our lives. So let's pray together. Lord, we come in the name of Jesus to you, Father, and we rejoice we are heard by you in Christ. And so I pray over all under the sound of my voice that your Holy Spirit would be the ultimate teacher here, that you would open the eyes of our hearts to the scriptures, open the scriptures to the eyes of our hearts. We plead it. I pray for those who are in this room who came unbelieving, not believers. I pray today is the day of their salvation. Speak to them specifically. I pray for any gathered and their trust has been in anything, anyone else other than Christ. I pray today is their day of belief and trust in you. And so we commit this time to you in Jesus' name, amen. amen. It was years ago, we had someone gift our family tickets to go see the Philadelphia 76ers play ball. And uh, this is when the 76ers were awful. So it was really easy for these tickets to happen. And it was someone within the organization, a friend who knew a friend there. And so they gifted us these tickets. It, at basketball games or football games, concerts, if you're given tickets from someone within the organization, what they'll do is they'll leave your name at a window called Will Call. So if you go to get your tickets from the game, they have windows for tickets, and they have this one specific window called Will Call. And so you'll walk up to Will Call, and you'll say your name, and then they'll look down the list, and there'll be your name, and they'll hand you the tickets. So we got to, to Philly really early and went really early to go get our tickets just so we'd never been to an NBA game as a family. And the kids were excited, and we'd been planning the trip for, for weeks and days, counting down the hours, the minutes, and there we were. I walk up to Will Call, said, my name is Jared Jones, here to pick up my tickets. They went down the list, and they go, there's no Jared Jones. And I said, hey, would you, would you try that one more time? And maybe you skip by it. She looked down at it again, and she looked at me, and she goes, there's no Jared Jones. And I sat there and stared at her for a minute. I said, would you check one more time, just in case? And she was so sad. She looked down and she just looked at me. She goes, I'm so sorry. There's no Jared Jones. Talk about devastated. So I had to walk away and go tell my kids, my family, you know, we don't have tickets. We're not going to go to the game. But you know, here's the thing. It's one thing to walk up to an NBA game and not have your name on will call. It's a whole nother devastation when you stand before Jesus and he doesn't know your name. Whew. So welcome to Grace today. <laughs> As we're following the scriptures, and here we are at, a, at another disturbing section of the Sermon on the Mount. So Jesus is giving judgment talk here. He's winding down the Sermon on the Mount and bringing it to application. And he's winding it down with judgment. So a couple of weeks ago, we saw that Narrow was the way to life. Broad is the way that leads to destruction. That's judgment talk. Last week we heard Jesus talk about false prophets, false teachers, and their destination in the end was fire and those who follow them. So judgment talk. And now he gets to the place today of judgment talk in this way. Watch this, Matthew 7. Jesus says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven, on that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. So let's pick this apart for a minute, then we'll get into some application here. First of all, notice the word everyone. 
He says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, if I'm in the crowd or if I'm sitting there where you are, I would have thought, I think Jesus misspoke. I, did he just say not everyone? Because I, I think he meant everyone. Everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will be saved. But I look again, I go, no, that's not, a, that's not at all what he said. He said, not everyone will be saved. Then he says, many, <clears throat> many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not do these things in your name? Now, the word many, we keep seeing the, a refrain of many, 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 that Jesus keeps, keeps giving over and over again over the last couple of weeks, even to this moment. Many will say. I looked up the, the biggest data breaches in U.S. history, and number one was Yahoo. Three billion people had their information hacked. That's many people. So when Jesus says many, he's not talking about an odd few here or there. He's saying many billions are in for the shock of their lives. Because that's when he says, did, these people will say, did we not? Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? The phrase, did we not? That's a phrase of shock, did we not? And a phrase of, this is unfair, did we not? And that's how it will look. Then he says, I never knew you. Meaning, I never knew relationship with you. Or I never knew a right relationship with you. You believed things about me that weren't true. You had the wrong me. So therefore, I never knew you. And then he says, you workers of lawlessness. That word lawlessness means simply to be a law unto yourself. You define right or wrong according to you and your desires and your feelings. It's rebellion. It could be read this way. Depart from me, you workers of rebellion. You rebelled against my created order. You rebelled against what I reviewed through all of scripture of what's truly right and what's truly wrong. Therefore, depart from me. I never knew you. So what do we do with this? Well, I want to talk for a little while about false assurance of salvation and true assurance of salvation. So there's a false assurance you can have in things, religious things in your life that you think God will accept or deep down you say God must accept and it be false assurance. But I don't want to leave you depressed today. I want to bring it to true, to true assurance of how you can be assured that you truly are right with God and Jesus would never say, depart from me, I never knew you. So let's deal with false assurance first because the scriptures encourage us to self-examine. 2 Corinthians 12, 5, Paul says, examine yourself to see if you're in the faith. So that's what we'll do today. So beware of false assurance, meaning do not rely on these things that you are right with God. And the first one is this, profession. So this person says, Lord, 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 but says, Lord, that's a profession. And it's a profession that leads to Jesus saying, I never knew you. That's, that's sobering. So what do we mean here by profession? <clears throat> well, there's profession that scripture says we must profess. We must confess with our lips that Jesus is Lord. So that, that's there. But also we see with what Jesus teaches in the New Testament and the New Testament as a whole, there can be a profession that's false. How so? Well, here's one way. It can be a profession of tradition. Let me read this. Matthew chapter three, verse eight, Jesus says, prove by the way you live that you have repented of your sins and turned to God. Don't just say to each other, we're safe for we are descendants of Abraham. That means nothing. So he's speaking to the Jews in that day, and here's what they're saying. I am right with God because my mom and dad were Jewish. Just like you could say, I am right with God because I grew up Catholic, or I grew up Lutheran, or because I grew up in a Christian household. I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian because I keep most of the commandments. I'm a Christian because I follow the golden rule. That's a false profession. You're, ba you're basing your eternity on a profession that is false. It's that saying, I heard this as a teenager from, I don't know if it was my youth pastor or a student conference. He said this, because people, there are people who think if I go to church, 
that means I'm a Christian. If I go to mass, that means I'm a Christian. If I go to confession, that means I'm a Christian. We can have faith in traditional kind of religious activities. And so this, this, I think it was my youth pastor said, just as going into, going into a garage does not make you a car, just as going into a church does not make you a Christian. And I, I thought of it this way as well. So check out this picture. I showed it to the other services. I'll show it to you too. How about that? <clears throat> That's a beautiful collie, isn't it? Take a, look at the, take a look at its paws. That's not a real collie. There's a dude inside that, you know, that, inside that costume. This guy believes he's a collie. So he had custom made a $16,000 costume of a collie. And now he spends, his dream was to live in this collie and be a collie, walks on all fours. Now we don't laugh at that because we think he needs help, don't we? And he does. But here's the thing. Looks like a collie, walks like a collie, not a collie. You could look like a Christian, walk like a Christian, have words like a Christian, go places that are Christian and not be a Christian. It can be a false assurance. So that's, that's one angle of it. Jesus says it means nothing if you look to something else traditionally that you would say makes you a Christian. Then there's the angle of profession that means, in a phrase, God forgives me anyway. So I just live the way I want. Scriptures speak hardcore to that belief. Watch this. Just in, I'm just choosing Jude. There were many. Jude says, there are people like that who are teaching that. He said, I say this because some ungodly people have wormed their way into your churches saying that God's marvelous grace allows us to live immoral lives. The condemnation of such people was recorded long ago for they have denied our only master and Lord, Jesus Christ. I've never understood how someone believes they're a Christian in the sense they, they can live like hell and expect to go to heaven. I was one of those. I remember as a, I've shared this before, as a teenager, I had a pen, a little pen on the visor of my car that said, how much sin can I get away with and still go to heaven? That's not a Christian. And there are people who think, I can go to heaven because God's grace for me he understands how I am, and he forgives me anyway. So it doesn't matter who I sleep with. I'm a Christian. I'm going to heaven. It doesn't matter my behavior in my life or the way I deal with life and treat people. I'm going to heaven anyway because I'm forgiven. I'm a Christian. And just follow that thread on out. And what we find is that kind of thinking and that kind of living kind of living denies Jesus Christ in your life. It's a denial of him. So that's a false assurance. God's forgiveness, God's grace. Now, don't get me wrong. God's forgiveness and God's grace is a marvel. But if there's no fruit coming out of that of obedience, and we'll talk about that in a while, you are lost, my friend. So beware of a false assurance just on a profession. Secondly, there can be a false assurance regarding emotions. Because notice... In that text, he didn't just say, the, the, the person didn't just say, Lord. They said, Lord, Lord, twice. Lord, Lord. There's some passion behind that. There's some, there's some emotion behind that. Lord, Lord. Let's watch what the scriptures say, though, about this. So I'm going to flip over to Romans 10, where the apostle Paul is talking to his Jewish people. And he says, brothers and sisters, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. For I can testify that they have a zeal for God, but it is not based on knowledge. Not knowing the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own, they have not submitted to God's righteousness. <clears throat> a lot there. We'll talk about it in a bit. But notice the phrase, for I can testify that they have a zeal for God, but it is not based on knowledge. So I pray that they may be saved. John Piper, if you've probably never heard of him, but he's one of my theological heroes. When I was in seminary, he came and spoke at our chapel. And he read that text right there. And after he read it, here's what he said. He said, you can have a passion for God 
and still go to hell. It was quiet in that room too. And that's exactly what Paul just said. You can have a zeal for God and not be saved. You can have a passion for God. You can be emotional, spiritually emotional, emotions around Christianity and music and all of that and still be lost if it's not based on knowledge, knowing the right Jesus Christ and not something made up in your feelings or desires. So think about that. I love emotions now. Don't get me wrong. I think as Christians, we ought to have moments where we are emotional. I mean, it could be over your sin. It could be when you're born again. It could be emotions of the song. It could be something I'm preaching. I know when I've preached, I've gotten emotional in the middle of a sermon just because of, I believe, the move of the Holy Spirit. But let's be careful that we count all emotions as a movement of the Holy Spirit. As, as proof that we would say, I'm truly a Christian. We can't do that. I mean, I get emotional listening. I, I get emotional listening to our worship music, just as I still get emotional sometimes over Whitney Houston songs. <laughs> I heard one, I read somewhere where a guy had left the Christian faith. And here's one, one here's what the excuse, was the excuse I remember reading. He said, the reason I left the Christian faith is because I realized The emotions I had in a worship service was the same emotions I would experience at a concert with Coldplay. Coldplay, the band. And so I thought, well, that's someone who never was truly a believer. They had professed faith around some emotional experience they had, and then when it can be mimicked somewhere else, well, it must not be true. That's why you can't base your salvation on emotions and feelings and desires because they can lead you astray as well. So you could profess to be a Christian because of the emotions I have and still be lost. The third way there's false assurance for you or me is knowledge. Now I just said knowledge is important. Isn't that what just Paul said? I mean, it's, they have a zeal for God, but not based on knowledge. But here we are saying that knowledge could be a false assurance. It can Let me show you one place here quickly in James 2, 19. You say you have faith, for you believe that there is one God good for you. Even the devil, even the demons believe this, and they tremble in terror. So Jesus said back in Matthew 7, I never knew you. I didn't have knowledge of you. To which they were saying, but we we did. We had knowledge of you. But they base their, it's basing the profession on something that ultimately doesn't save. So let me read it again. You say you have faith, for you believe that there is one God good for you. Even the demons believe this, and they tremble in terror. So that phrase right there, believe that there is one God, that's a, not, that's a doctrine statement. Even the demons have perfect doctrine. They know the Bible inside and out and all the context with it. But they will never, ever repent. They will never, ever obey. And they will never, ever worship Jesus Christ as the Lord of all. Yet, they have perfect knowledge, perfect doctrine. That is so sobering to me personally as I study the Bible and and ground myself and be sure I'm preaching truth and doctrine and theology. Even if you don't hear those words, that's what everything I'm doing up here is these truths. And yet you can have the perfect truth and be lost. Serial killer, uh, BTK. I don't know if you remember this serial killer that made the news many, many years ago. BTK, that's what they called him. I watched an interview with him. Did you know he was a deacon at his church? And in the interview said, I read my Bible every day. So he was a deacon serving his church, read the Bible faithfully every day. And do I have to say it? Lost. So you can read your Bible every day. You can know the Bible in and out. You can have wonderful doctrine. I believe there is one God in Jesus Christ, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the Trinity. And you can break it all down and be lost. So having perfect doctrine, I'm all about doctrine. We talked about that last week, but you can have it perfectly, yet the Lord not know you because you had faith in the knowledge, not faith in Christ. Also, lastly, a false assurance around 
your deeds. Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? It's all deeds. And you would think, I would think, if I saw people doing this, they are absolutely Christians. They're super Christians. You know, even the disciples did this. The disciples that followed Jesus, he would send them out, they would preach, they would heal the sick, they would cast out demons. But I want you to notice something about them. Matthew chapter 10, verse 1. Jesus called his 12 disciples together and gave them authority to cast out evil spirits and to heal every kind of disease and illness. All 12 of them, rocking and rolling. Here are the names of the 12. I'll skip to the last one. Judas Iscariot, who later betrayed him. So Judas was doing all, this, all these religious deeds, even, even living a Christian life, Casting out demons, healing people who are sick, and in the end, lost. So, we can keep most of the commandments, we can live by the golden rule, and we can serve the Lord faithfully in his church, or in the inner city, or in the charity, but in the end, it comes down to you in relationship with Christ. And if we have any faith in knowledge, in our works, or in simply our profession or emotions, we are lost. Are you lost? Have you placed faith in profession and emotions and knowledge or deeds? If so, I'm glad you're here. Because now, I want to give you the true assurance. Aren't you glad we're here now? Aren't you glad we're at this part? True assurance. So how can you walk out of here today, out of there today, with true assurance that you are a Christian? Here's the first one, your confession. <laughs> See how closely, how close these are? This is where it can get subtle. So there's the profession, but it's a profession around, well, I grew up that way, or my household was this. Or it's a profession around, oh, I, God forgives me anyway. But this is a confession of Lord, Lord from the heart, because you're not saved Unless you truly are saying, Lord, Lord. So let's don't just gloss over that. You must say, Lord, Lord, to be born again. I mean, that should be coming out of your heart. It's a confession, but it's the right confession of what you mean behind the confession. So let me read this text. It's a little, it's a little wordy, but I'll break it down. Romans 3. But now the righteousness of God apart from the law, the do's and the don'ts, the Ten Commandments, is revealed being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and placed on all who believe. So this is knowing the right Jesus Christ. It's, it's a confession, not just he's Lord, Lord. It's a confession of what you mean behind Lord, Lord. So it's confessing this. I am unrighteous before God. I am zero for 10, 10 commandments. James said you break one, you broke them all for life. It's, it's owning. I confess I'm a rebel before God. I'm a sinner before God. I have a sinful nature before God. Therefore, I am unrighteous. I am not right with God. And there is nothing I can do to make myself righteous, to make myself right with God. I'm too corrupt in my soul, in my heart. I'm too much of a rebel. And so you, you know this. But here's the joy. It's saying, I'm not, I will never be right enough. But Jesus is. And so Jesus comes to us righteous, without sin, his whole life. The son of God, right with God. He goes to the cross, and this is, this is the glory. He who was right, righteous before God, takes my unrighteousness and yours on himself. What a marvel. He who knew no sin, 2 Corinthians 5, became sin, became your sin, my sin, that we might be made right, righteous with God. So Jesus goes on the cross to take 
what you deserved and I deserved as being rebels before the God who created us. He took punishment. He took the wrath of God in our place because he was unrighteous with yours and my sin and he was crushed there, experienced hell there, all that we deserved, but on the third day rose again. And when he rose from the grave, he proved that he is the son of God who was mighty enough to take your unrighteousness and mine and die with it and rose from the grave to show he is mighty enough then to make you righteous before God, to make you right with God. That is called the gospel. So when you confess, when I confess, Lord, Lord, the assurance is what you mean behind Lord, Lord. It doesn't mean he's my Lord, Lord, because of he's soothing and calming and wonderful and all of that. That's true. But be sure you don't stop there because God is love, but he's also holy, holy, holy. Righteousness, no sin can be in his presence. So when you confess, Lord, Lord, your assurance is I could never be right with God. I could never keep enough of the commandments. I could never live out the golden rule enough. I could never give enough to charity. I could never do enough. I'm too unrighteous. But Jesus came in my place and he is righteous and he became unrighteous for me and he took the wrath of God in my place and he rose up from the grave showing he conquered it all and through my faith in him, I'm a child of God. That's the confession. So true assurance is when you confess, and that's behind your confession, what he's done for you on the cross. Is that your confession today? If that's your confession, that's assurance. That's assurance that you're confessing the right Christ, the right God for you. So that's confession, true assurance. Also true assurance is obedience. So it's not enough to have a true confession. The fruit that it was a true confession is now that you live a right life. So you're made righteous in the heavenlies before God through Christ. But now the fruit of that, that that's true, is you live rightly. You, you seek to live righteously. You put feet to that righteousness that happened here. So watch this, Ephesians chapter five. This is when Jesus said, the will of the will, who, who, he who does the will of my father in heaven, those who are not practicing lawlessness. Here's what he says, Ephesians five. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. So you take this rightness that has happened with you and God, what Christ has accomplished for you, and now you put feet to it. And here's the glory. You don't live righteous in order to be made right with God. You live righteously because you have been made right with God. You don't live and obey God in order to be loved by him. You live and obey God because you know you are loved by him. Not in order to be. See, that's, that's so crucial. That was so freeing to me. I never understood it that way for decades, that I don't have to live in a way to earn your love. I live for you because I'm loved. That's your freedom. That's your strength. That's the Holy Spirit at work in you to want to live out this obedience. Not how much sin can I get away with and still go to heaven. Even more practically speaking, watch the way the Apostle John puts this. If I can find it. There we go. 1 John 3, 9. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning for God's seed or God's life abides in him and he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God, born again of God. Now notice those words. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning. Now let's be clear. There's not a person in here who's gonna go sin less. I mean, we're barely going to get out the door today, and we've already sinned somewhere in our mind or in our heart, so we're not going to be perfect and sinless. But we don't make a practice of sinning. We make a practice of repenting. So it's not a life of sin. It's a life of repentance. It's realizing sin in your life. You're more conscious to it. You're more sensitive to it. And then when it 
comes up in your life, you hate it more and more because you know if you practice it, then are you really saved? And if you practice it or you tend to give in to it more and more, it distances you from the presence of Christ and the, and, the, and the Holy Spirit within you talks about grieving the Holy Spirit. You can do that and I can do that in our lives. So it's saying, no, out of, out of being loved for him, I want to love him by not practicing sin, but practicing repentance, hating my sin more and more. It's interesting. And I meant to look this up. The apostle Paul, when you watch his life, he's, he encounters Christ. He, he put, puts his faith in Christ. He becomes a Christian. And he begins with, I was a sinner. And then, he, then later on, when you think he's having more and more of a saintly life, he goes on to say, I'm the chief of sinners. And he keeps going and he goes, and, and there are sinners of whom I'm the worst. That's the trajectory of his life. I would think he's getting better and better. But what he's experiencing is this sin that creeps into my life. It distances me from God. And I want it more and more out of my life. It makes me so much more dependent on him and his grace, his divine enablement. So in the same way, that's the life of obedience. It's the Holy Spirit at work and you put feet to the rightness that's been done in you. So are you pursuing obedience? Are you practicing repentance? That's assurance. That's an assurance of salvation. Third is doctrine. So you can have a true assurance if your doctrine's right. I've kind of beat on this a little bit last week, but I got to go there one more time. We talked about knowledge. Remember that knowledge a minute ago? That's doctrine and how you and I can be lost even if we have the perfect doctrine like the demons did at the same time. See, it's so subtle. Your doctrine must be sound. And the reason it must be sound is because you, you and I are saved by the real Jesus. If you believe in the wrong Jesus, that wrong Jesus does not save you. Romans 10, the Apostle Paul. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. So what's going on here? This is a lot of doctrine talk. So watch, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, pause. Now, we all know that you could walk up on the, on the street and look at the person who's actually an atheist and say, would you say Jesus is Lord? And they might go, Jesus is Lord. Are they saved? Well, obviously not because they are, well, they're atheists, of course, but anybody, any unbeliever could say Jesus is Lord and not believe. And it goes to show you can confess that and not be saved. So what's the point? To confess the right Lord. You're confessing the right Jesus Christ, the right Jesus, the Lord, that we've already spoken of regarding the righteousness and what he's done on your behalf and mine. It's the Jesus is Lord of the entire Bible, not the Jesus is Lord of cutting and pasting what you like and you don't like out of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I mean, Jesus, I mean, Jesus spoke of hell more than he did of heaven. But it's so easy to cut and paste all the judgment talk out of it. Well, that's the wrong Jesus, and he will not save you. The real Jesus does. So that's the confession. Jesus is that Lord. Believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. That's doctrine talk. What this means is God raised him physically from the dead. If you believe that God did not raise him physically, it was just something spiritually, you are lost. Because the scriptures fall apart if there was no physical resurrection. And everything Paul talks about is a physical resurrection where Jesus showed up. He ate fish. He, he spoke with his disciples. He cooked some fish on the beach. Physical. So that's doctrine. If you don't believe the doctrine that Jesus Christ physically rose from the grave, you are lost. And then it goes on to say you will be saved if you believe that. For with the heart, one believes and is justified. There's another doctrine word. Justified is simply what I've just explained about the righteousness of Christ. He took your unrighteousness to give you his righteousness, and now you stand before God not guilty. Justified in his sight as his child. And with the mouth, one confesses and is saved. One confesses the truth, the true Jesus, and is saved. Do you have the correct doctrine? And all that means is, do you worship the right Jesus? Do you believe in the right Jesus? He's the one who saves. And then finally, a true assurance is found in dependence on the Lord. Dependence. 
This is how Jesus began the entire Sermon on the Mount with this first statement. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And from there, everything soared. So sometimes there have been people who become Christians and they think, I believe in Jesus, I'm saved, and then you go on to live your life. But what we find in scripture is, no, as you are saved, there's a a desire to hate sin in your life. There's more and more of a desire of the need you have for God because of sin that kind of puts its claws into you. And then there's just a sense of I'm nothing without him. I mean, I need him. I need him not only for my righteousness to be made right with him. I need him to just behave rightly. I need him so desperately for my marriage to work. I need him so deeply so I don't ruin my kids' lives. Or I need him so deeply so that my kids will come home. I need him in my work. I need him in my play. I need him when I go to sleep. I need him when I wake up. I need him when I take a shower. I need him when I brush my teeth. I need him when I get in my car and I drive down the road. I need him. I need him. I need him. I'm dependent on him with all my might. That's true assurance right there. Now, let's be careful. That ebbs and flows. Remember, we still have a tendency to step into our own dependence, self-dependence, but that's why we practice repentance. We recognize it in our lives and we take our step back to the Lord himself. So I'm leaving from the 76ers game with my family and I hear something, Mr. Jones, turn around, walk back up, found your name here are your tickets we got to see the game what a day for you to stand before Jesus and he look at you and say I know your name Revelation 3 5 the one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments, righteousness for all time. And I will never blot out his name out of the book of life. I will confess his name, her name, before my father and before his angels forever. That is the ultimate will call. And I pray your name is on it. Let's pray. So with your heads bowed, I haven't done this in a long time. Uh, did it this morning. And we've seen several people come to Christ in this room and at other rooms there across our locations, even right there online in the chat. So this is a moment I'm looking to you to say, did you come here today and you have no faith? You, you came with no faith, no belief in God. Somehow you came. Maybe you were curious. Maybe someone invited you. Maybe you were guilted into coming. Maybe you're like me and you're going through a crisis and you have nowhere else to turn and here you are and you're open, but you know you're not saved. Today is your day. I don't know how to be any clearer. May God be bringing his revelation through me, even in this moment, to say you trust, believe, be saved. I believe there are those who came today, you've been coming to grace for years, decades maybe. Maybe you're coming from another church. Maybe you're coming from a tradition and you've had assurance on, you've behaved good enough, you lived the golden rule mostly, you've tried to be a good person or you attend church and every week or every other week or you go to confessions or you pray certain prayers and that's been your assurance. But today, perhaps you've been confronted with that has not saved me. That has not made me right with God. Only faith in Christ makes me right with God. If that's you, I want to invite you. Be saved today with the real Christ, with the real Lord. Which brings me to say maybe you today have realized I've been saying I'm a Christian but I've been living with and living however I want, thinking God forgives me anyway. 
and I'm coming home to find my rightness in him and then to live that rightness. Maybe today you're here and you follow Jesus, you would say. You love Jesus. But maybe you've realized, I have loved the wrong Jesus. I've had my perspective, but it was a Jesus that was created out of my own feelings and my own desires, not the true one. I invite you today for true assurance. Place your faith in Christ who is the way, the truth, and the life. And with that, here's what I want to invite you to do. And this is nothing magical about this, nothing supernatural. It's just something I pray is a symbol of a moment of you accepting Christ as your Lord and Savior for the first time. And it's just between me and you or maybe some of the team up here and you. I'm not going to say your name, make you stand up. All I ask, would you just raise your hand and say, today, I'm raising my hand as if I'm raising my hand to take the Father's hand of salvation today. And I just want to celebrate and clap and pray over you here in just a moment. Is there anyone at our campuses, anyone there on the chat line, you can do a little hand there or let someone know And anyone in this room. If that's you, would you just raise your hand and let me see and praise God for you. Wow, all over the room. God bless you, sir. God bless you. God bless you, ma'am. God bless you. All the way in the back. Really a lot over here. I'm at my right right now. God bless you. Over toward the back. Anybody else to my right? God bless you, ma'am. I see you. Lord, I pray over everyone who's raised their hand to my right. Lord, you see them. You know their name. Their name is written in the book of life. You have confessed these names to, before the angels in this moment. I look to my middle here. Anybody here in the middle? Okay. God bless you, all of you. Yes. God bless you. In the middle, toward the back. I see you way in the back. Yep. God bless you. So many. Wow. Lord, I pray for all who have raised their hands right here in the middle. Holy Spirit, begin a work of life and truth and growth. Thank you, God, that in this moment there's been a miracle that they are now sons and daughters of God and you know their name and you have confessed their name right now before the angels. Praise you. Look to my left. God bless you here on the front. In the back, in the back, I see you. God bless you. God bless you, sir. Yep. God bless you, ma'am. Lord, thank you for those to my left here. I praise you and I pray that your Holy Spirit will be so deeply felt in them, strengthening them. And this is a moment where they have set off on the path to follow you with all their hearts. Thank you, Lord, that Although I don't know their names right now, you know their names and you have confessed their names in the heavens. Praise your name. With your heads bowed, one more encouragement here. If today you're here and you're like, you know, I'm not raising my hand because I don't know if I really believe all this. I'm open, but, or even you're like, I don't believe this at all. Or maybe you're here and you've heard this and you're like, I don't, I don't know if I agree with everything I'm hearing or I don't know if I can accept it. That's okay. Wrestle with it. Struggle with it. Ask questions about it. Keep coming back. Keep coming back and read the Bible and pray to the Holy Spirit that he would confirm these things. I know he will. He will in his own good time. So Lord, we praise you. Grace community, let's just praise God. We got new brothers and sisters all over the place today. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus Christ, our Lord, we give you glory and we give you praise for who you are and what you have done for us. All glory, honor, and power to you. Thank you for the power of the gospel. Thank you for the power of your Holy Spirit to see the miracles of people born into new life today, whose names echo around the heavens today. Praise you for the miracle of salvation. What a gift. And thank you for the gift of getting to see it today. Praise your name. 
And then Lord, for the rest of us, may we live, live, leave here today inspired of the soul and encouraged in, the Holy, in your Holy Spirit to live our lives saying, yes, I will for your glory. Yes, I will live rightly because you're worthy and worth it. Yes, I will. May it be so. In Jesus' name, we all said, amen, amen. amen. God bless you. <laughs>